Track one. Hey, Jenny. Oh, hi, Steve. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. How's it going? Fine, thanks. I'm so glad the exams have finished. Me, too. So, are you going on a holiday this summer? Yes. I've decided to go to Mexico for the whole summer vacation, six weeks in total. That sounds great. What are you going to do there? Well, actually, it's a working holiday. I'm going to work at a school teaching English to children. What about you? I'm going to Paris for two weeks. Are you going with your family? No, I'm going with my best friend. We've enrolled in a language school to study French. That sounds like fun. Have a good trip. You too. Track two. Good afternoon, Royal Mount Hotel. How may I help you? Hello. Um, I'd like to book a twin room, please, for next week. One minute, please. I'll just check if we have one available. Yes, we do, sir. Now, I just need to take down a few details, if I may. Yes, of course. What name is the booking under? Uh, my name? Duncan Jeffrey. That's G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. Uh -huh. And could I have a contact telephone number, please? Uh, yes. 5762-238-21. When will you be arriving, sir? Sometime on the evening of the 19th. Of September? Yes, and we'll be leaving on the 23rd. How much will that be in total? So, that's a twin room. For a twin, it would normally be £235, but I can give you a special rate as it's low season. £210 for the six nights. Great, thank you. And how would you like to pay, sir? We accept cash, cheque or credit card. I'll pay cash on arrival, if that's OK. Of course, sir. We look forward to seeing you. Track 3 So, what are the differences between these four hotels? Well, the main difference is in the facilities they offer. The Hotel Sunshine is the only one which has a gym, and it's also got one of the top health spas in the area. It's next to a lake, so you can do water sports there. But if you really like sailing or water skiing, then the Highland Hotel would probably be the best place because it offers great instruction programmes in these sports. Actually, I'm not a sporty person. OK. Um, well, what about the Hotel Carminia? It's a brand new hotel and it prides itself on its cinema and multimedia centre. And then there's the Royal. This one has a conference room, a meeting room and free computer access – but it's not really appropriate for children. There's not much in the way of entertainment. Well, I'm going on holiday, not to work, and it's just my wife and me, so I think we'll book with the Hotel Carminia, please. Track four. So, there's a great walking tour tomorrow morning. Or tomorrow night, we could go on the cruise round the harbour. What do you think, John? Well, we've got theatre tickets for tonight, so we'll be too tired for the walking tour in the morning. But I don't fancy the cruise either. Why not? It'll be fun. Look, it's a dinner cruise and it's only $12 each. I hate the sea and I'll be sick with fear if the waves are big. And dinner? On a boat? I just couldn't. <laughs> but we'll be in the harbour. Still. Ah, what about this? There's a bus tour tomorrow evening. It's only $5.50 and it goes all around the main tourist sites. Yeah, that sounds OK, but I'd much rather... Track 5 Where shall we eat tonight? Well, there are plenty of options. The guide says this city has hundreds of restaurants. What kind of food would you like to have, John? Well, I quite like seafood. There's the captain's table on Firth Street. The guide gives it four stars. Hmm, I don't know. The hotel receptionist told me the service is slow. But if you like seafood, there are a couple more places in the guide. Ah, uh, yes. Mangan's or Joe's Cafe. What about those, Sam? Mangan's could be a good option. It's nicer than Joe's Cafe, and there are fantastic views as well. We'd probably pay a bit extra. Joe's Cafe is much cheaper. But we're on holiday. I think we should splash out. That sounds great. Oh, no. Hold on, it's closed tonight. Oh, what a shame. Shall we go to Joe's Cafe then? Yes, I suppose we'll have to. 
I'll give them a call and book a table. Can I use your phone? Uh, no. Sorry. I've left my phone in the hotel. We can ask the receptionist to do it. Let's go back now and sort it out. We can get changed and have a drink before dinner if you like. OK, good idea. Track 6 Hello, how can I help you? Um, hello. Is it possible to book a bus tour of the city here? Of course, sir. When would you like to take the tour? There are tours in the morning, afternoon and evening. Sometimes it's nice to see the city at night with the buildings lit up. We'll be going out for dinner tonight, so we'd prefer to go this afternoon. Oh, and it's for two people. Right. Now, I just need some details. Can you give me the names of the two people, please? Yes. Susan Field and James Carter. Susan Field and James... Sorry, can you spell your surname for me, please? It's Carter. C-A-R-T-E-R. -E Thank you. And can I have a contact telephone number? Why do you need one? Just in case we have to cancel the tour and need to contact you. I see. Well, my mobile number is 07988-636-197. That's 07988-636-197. Now, can you also tell me which hotel you're staying at? The Crest Hotel. Oh, uh, no, sorry. That's the hotel we're staying in next week. It's the Riverside Hotel. Oh, the Riverside is a lovely hotel. Are you enjoying your stay? Yes, we are, very much. We definitely recommend it to others. Oh, I am glad. Now, I can book you on the tour at 4pm. Would that suit you? Alternatively, there is one at 2. 2 would be better for us, please. Right. That's booked for you, sir. Two people at 2pm today, August the 14th. You pay the bus driver when you get on and it's £4 per person. Thank you very much. Track 7 Can I also ask you about the museum in the main square? I was reading about it in my guidebook and was shocked to see that the entrance price is £10. Why does it cost so much? Well, the museum has the largest collection of Latin American art in Europe. People come from all over the world to see it. But that's not the reason why it's so expensive to get in. You see, the building is very old and it needs repairs. The £10 ticket cost will go towards repairing the roof and the walls. I see. Well, I suppose it's worth paying £10 to see the collection. Yes, I think so too. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. I was wondering if you knew of any good restaurants in the area. Well, there are a few restaurants near the harbour and a couple on the beach, which are nice. The problem is that the smell of the fish market is quite strong down there. Mm, I don't think my girlfriend would be very pleased. I know what you mean. It's not very romantic, is it? <laughs> my advice would be to go to the next town. It's bigger and the restaurant selection is wider. You can get there by taxi and it only takes about ten minutes. The town is quite picturesque. Is it for a special occasion? Yes, it's my girlfriend's birthday, so I'd like to go somewhere special. Uh, do you know any of these restaurants well enough to tell me about them? Well, I know about a few of them and there are pictures in this leaflet here. Oh, this one here is lovely, the Bellevue, and it's extremely popular. It has a famous chef, so it's not cheap, but the standard of the food is very high. It's right by the sea and there are wonderful views if you get a good table. Then there's the Lighthouse Cafe. You can see the picture here, which isn't really a cafe at all. In fact, it's a great restaurant and a lot of TV celebrities and actors eat there. The place has been going for over a hundred years. It's quite an institution around here. Mm, I'm not sure about those two. They sound too expensive to me. I was thinking of somewhere small, not too upmarket, but with good food. In that case, what about Harvey's? The same family has run this restaurant for over a century and it's reasonably priced and really popular with local people. Oh, and there's another family-run restaurant, Stonecroft House. New owners took over a month ago and they're getting good reviews. There's a new chef there and the food is meant to be very good. This leaflet has the contact details for all the restaurants so you can just call them if you'd like to book a table. Great, thanks. You've been very helpful. Track 8
Hello, everyone. Sorry to interrupt your class. I just want to make a quick announcement about our summer timetable. Shimmer's Dance School will be offering new classes this spring due to strong demand. Angela Stevenson will be back this term running the ballet class. This class will be on Tuesdays, and instead of the normal hour from 6.30 to 7.30, we'll be running the class for an hour and a half, so it'll continue until 8 o'clock. This means we have to charge higher fees, but only slightly higher, from £8.50 to £10.50. That's only £2 for the extra half hour. Next, Janine Davis will still be teaching the tango classes. Instead of being on Mondays, these classes will be on Wednesday nights from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. The fee will still be £7.50 for the hour. Last but not least, Andrew is taking over the tap class. This class is for early risers as it starts at 8.30 on Saturday morning and finishes at 10. We expect this class to be very popular, as tap is a great way to get fit while learning new dancing skills. This will cost £11. All the other classes remain the same as the winter timetable. We hope there's something for all of you at Shimmers. Track 9 Internet safety is a big concern nowadays, and to protect your children and teenagers online, it's a good idea to monitor the sites they visit. Don't be put off from letting your kids use the internet. It's essential for their education and can help them make friends too. Now, let me tell you a bit about some sites we found for children. Of course, there's a limited number of sites for the very young, but we would suggest one called Playtime Online. It's designed for children from four to six years old. It's really colourful and helps children learn skills for games. Children love it and it helps them when they begin school. Then from, say, five until about ten years of age, there's a really useful website called Moving Up. This takes playtime online a step further and enhances the maths and language skills of the child. Teachers speak highly of this site for child development. When children get into their teens, the internet can be a more dangerous place. Net Aware, for the 12 to 16 year age group, makes young people more aware of online dangers. It's a good site for your child to look at before they start surfing on their own. Now, all teenagers love chatting, and Chat Electric is a site designed specifically for teens from 13 to 16 to make friends online with people their own age. The last site is invaluable for teens studying for exams. 16 to 18 year olds love Test Doctors which is a site designed to help students revise for their exams and is full of handy hints and tips. The site is run by subject specialists, so it's packed full of information. Track 10 The Health and Education Summer Camp in the county of Cork in Southern Ireland is ideal for young people who'd like to learn new sports and activities. It has a beautiful location near a river and occupies five acres. The camp has two types of accommodation, tents and cabins, both of which are modern and comfortable. The cabins are by the river and the tents are on higher ground, away from the river and next to the washrooms. There are two washroom blocks, fully equipped with showers as well as toilets. We also have facilities for cooking here. We provide all the pots, pans and utensils. All cooking is done in the cooking area, which is situated in the centre of the camp. This gives the camp a real social focal point. Track 11 The Duke of Edinburgh's Award is a programme of activities designed to help young people from all backgrounds develop personally. There are three levels, bronze, silver and gold, and for each level, participants have to complete a series of activities in four categories, volunteering, physical, skills and expedition. This talk will explain what you have to do in order to get a bronze award. The first thing you need to do is find a Duke of Edinburgh Centre near you. This could be your school, college or youth club. Then you'll need to pay a small fee to enrol in the programme. Once you've enrolled, you'll get a welcome pack, which explains the four categories in more detail.
Then you can start planning what to do. You can do many different types of activity for each category, but you must get them approved by your Duke of Edinburgh coordinator before you start, so you don't waste time doing something which is not approved. The other important person is your assessor. This is the person who will certify that you've completed each activity by signing your record book. After you've completed all the activities in the time given, your assessor will send your record book results to the operating authority, who will check it. If everything is satisfactory, you'll get your certificate and badge to confirm you've completed the award, and after that, you can start working on the silver award. Track 12 Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to find out more about the new teen programme here at the Park Hill Leisure Centre. I'd like to take you through the programme, the classes available, describe the building itself, and then give you some information about how to register and sign up for the sports and activities we offer. Afterwards, you'll have an opportunity to take a tour of the centre. We also have some taster sessions with our instructors, which we hope you'll enjoy and which will motivate you to sign up. Let's go through the classes first. As you can see from the teen programme handout in your pack, we have lots of classes on offer. Our instructors are highly qualified and have lots of experience training young people. Diana is our dance instructor and she gives classes in jazz and salsa on Wednesday and Thursday evenings respectively. Jim usually takes the football practice sessions but this year he is branching out into American sports and will be running the baseball club on Saturday afternoons. We think this will be very popular. So Steve will now run the football practice this class has been changed from Saturday to Sunday afternoons. Steve will also take the skateboarding class on Monday evening. The roller skating course is for beginners and this will be taken by Stella, who was last year's under-21 London roller skating champion. So you'll be in good hands with her expert advice. The day of this course is still to be arranged, but it's likely to be Tuesday. We'll confirm the day by the end of this week. Track 13 Now, some of you won't have been to Park Hill Leisure Centre before, so let me just tell you a little about the layout. As you can see, the reception area here is very spacious and there is plenty of room to meet your friends and have a drink. We also have brand new dance studios with floor-to-ceiling mirrors and the latest audio equipment. The dance studios are to the left of the reception area behind the swimming pool. Oh, no, sorry, I meant opposite the swimming pool. Both the roller skating and skateboarding classes will be held in the skate arena. This has also been refurbished and we have a new 5 meter ramp in there which is proving to be popular. The arena is behind the changing rooms, which you can see behind us, between the gym and tennis courts. The tennis courts are on the right of the arena. You'll see both of these new spaces on the tour later. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is how to join the Park Hill Leisure Centre and enrol for the classes. First, you need to complete an enrolment form with some of your personal details, including your address and telephone number and the name of your school. If you're under 16 years old, then you'll also be required to get your parents' permission to take part in the classes. Please ask one of your parents to sign the authorisation form attached to the enrolment form. You'll find the form in your information pack. When you've done this, you just hand the forms to reception. You can pay an annual subscription of £20 or, alternatively, you can pay each time you use the facilities. There is a £1.60 admission fee in this case. Whether you decide to pay in one go or with each visit, you still need to complete the forms in your pack and become a member. Once we have the forms, we'll send your membership card to your home address. All you need to do is show this card every time you come to the centre and if you want to book a class, you just need your membership number on your card. Track 15 Hi everyone, 
How are you all? I'm fine, thanks, Linda. Actually, I'm not feeling so well. I think I've got a cold. Oh, no, Stephen. I'm sorry to hear that. What about you, Joanne? I'm fine, but I'm very busy with my biology course. Oh, me too. There's so much work to do. In that case, we should get started on our essay. John, do you want to start? OK. Let me start by telling you my ideas for the essay. Track 16 We've really got to decide who does what for our Natural Earth project. OK, Alice. Well, we've got all our cloud research, so let's decide how to break it down. Well, we should probably start by saying how clouds are formed. Good idea. And then maybe move on to the different types of clouds. We can separate it into low-lying, medium-level and high clouds. What do you think, Jenny? Yes, I think that's a good idea. And we should also make a PowerPoint to make it a bit more interesting and put in pictures of the different clouds. Good idea, Jenny. We should probably have cue cards, too. I'm useless at remembering what to say without them. Yes, me too. Well, I'm quite happy to organize everything we found out about clouds and make sure it fits into our presentation times. Actually, I'd better do that. I've got all the research on my computer, so it makes sense. How about if you make the presentation slides, Carl? OK, Alice. That's fine by me. Well, if you guys are going to do that, then I'll look on the internet for pictures of the different types of clouds. That'll be great, Jenny. I'll also make the prompt cards so we don't forget what we're saying during the presentation. Sounds great. Let's have a run-through on Tuesday. Uh, what sections does everyone want to talk about? I don't really mind. I hate speaking in front of people, so I'd prefer not to do the introduction. I don't mind. I'll do that. If you don't want to talk much, then why don't you just do the middle bit about the medium-level clouds? Yes, I can do the low-level and high-level clouds part. I'm sure Jenny can handle the summarizing, too. Thanks, guys. We can all take questions together. Track 17 Hi, Roger. Debbie. Hi, how are you? Oh, I've been struggling with my Natural Earth assignment. It's proving to be really difficult. The one for Professor Black? Me too. I'm writing about volcanic activity. What are you doing yours on? Acid rain. I thought that would be OK, but the process is really complicated. Well, I can help you with it. I know a lot about acid rain. I studied the causes and effects last year. Really? Oh, that's great. I've done some work on the causes. I'm going to write that acid rain is caused by sulphur dioxide from power plants and smelters. Basically, this reacts in the atmosphere to form acid rain. Ah, but it's not just sulphur dioxide. It's also nitrogen oxides. Really? Yes, from things like car exhausts. But aren't nitrogen oxides also caused by natural events too? Yes, they're a minor factor, but I think they're worth mentioning. But sorry, carry on. Thanks. I might add that. So anyway, these emissions react in the atmosphere with water, oxygen and oxidants to form acidic compounds like sulfuric acid. These compounds then fall to earth. Are you going to mention the different ways they return to the ground? Do you mean wet and dry deposition? Yes. So you've done a bit of background reading then? <laughs> yes. So if I've got it right... Acid rain often comes down as rain, but also as snow or fog. This is wet deposition. I'm also going to define it as any form of precipitation that removes acids from the atmosphere. Yes, I think that's a good term to define it. Dry deposition. Well, I think that's when the pollutants stick to the ground through dust. I'm not really sure how to define it, though, compared to wet deposition. Just think of it as any pollutants that are not caused through precipitation. That's probably the best way. Did you know that sunlight can enhance the effects of acid rain as well? No, I didn't. Oh, there's so much to think about. I'm sure I'll go over my word limit. Well, you sound like you know a lot about the subject. Just try and keep your focus. I've had the same problem writing about volcanoes. There's just so much. Track 18 Do you want to make a start on our Natural Earth project? I think our idea of a lightning safety presentation is great, don't you, Rachel? 
Yes, I think it'll be really good. I have a few ideas already. Oh, great. Me too. I think we should divide it into two parts. What to do if you're inside when lightning strikes and what to do if you're outside. What do you think? That's good, but we need more. Something about planning for this kind of event. And also, what to do if someone gets hit by lightning. Oh, I can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> of course. Well, what should we talk about in the first part? I think we should say it's important to be aware. Lightning is always before rain, so don't wait until it rains. As soon as you hear thunder or lightning, you should get inside. OK, yes. And then if you're indoors, you should avoid water, stay away from doors and windows and don't use the telephone. Or any electrical equipment. In fact, if you can, switch it off first. And you should wait half an hour after the last clap of thunder before going back outside. And if you're outside when it storms, you also need to avoid water. Try and get inside as soon as possible. There are certain things you should avoid open spaces, anything large and made of metal. And of course, the obvious one, trees. But we should mention that if lightning strikes very near you, you need to crouch down. Oh, is that right? I thought you had to stand still. No, that's actually wrong. You're supposed to crouch down. And put your hands over your ears. The noise can damage your hearing if you don't. OK, I think we've got quite a lot here. Only the last part to go. Now, what to do if someone gets hit? I think we should say that it's very rare for someone to get hit by lightning. Our talk sounds as if there's danger all around. We should try and make it sound a bit more reassuring. <laughs> yes, you're right. We'll say it doesn't happen often. It's just better to be safe than sorry. But what should we say about getting hit by lightning? Well... I think we should say it's safe to touch people who've been hit by lightning. They don't have any electrical charge. If there's a first aider around, then they should help them. Otherwise, it's just best to call for an ambulance. And we should remind our audience that 80% of lightning victims don't get fatally injured. That should calm everyone's nerves. Track 19 so, I think we'd better start planning what we're going to do for our group project. Have you guys had any ideas? I was thinking we should do something on extreme weather events, but I think Alex had some different ideas. Yes, maybe we should look into more localised weather conditions and the effects on the immediate environment. That's a good idea, Alex, but I don't think we'd be able to get much data on that and we don't really have time to do our own research. What about doing something about the seasons? I think the seasons might be a bit too wide-reaching, you know, when we take into account the wind patterns and pressure systems. Mm, maybe you're right. Well, how about Tom's idea of extreme weather conditions? Yes, that sounds like a good idea. It's easy to break down into separate parts, and it certainly sounds more interesting. I'd quite like to cover monsoons. I've been doing some reading on them, and they're quite interesting. Well, that sounds good. We should maybe take two areas each. That would make it easier for us to focus. Well, we've got lots to choose from. We could do blizzards, heat waves, droughts, cyclones. <laughs> there are loads. Why don't you do blizzards too, Tom? I don't fancy doing them, but I wouldn't mind doing something on floods. They're linked to monsoons, I think, so it will be an easy transition. What do you fancy doing, Alex? Well, I could always cover winds. Mm, but that isn't really extreme enough. Mm, I could do hurricanes. They're pretty exciting. How about doing cyclones, Emma? I'd rather do heat waves and droughts, I think. I know a bit about them. I don't know anything about cyclones. Cyclones are really interesting. I can cover them. That sounds great. I was thinking about doing cyclones, but I'm happy for you to do them. Track 20. Right, shall we get started on some of the content? Yes, we haven't got that much time. Does anyone know anything about their topics? I know quite a lot about cyclones. Do you? Well, I studied them at high school. You know, cyclones usually start near the equator. They need quite warm water to form. Above the warm water, the vapour in the air forms clouds. And if there is low pressure, then these clouds will start to rotate. 
Isn't it also the fact that the Earth rotates too, which makes the clouds spin more? Yes, that too. Once they begin rotating, they can either lose momentum or keep gathering momentum until they hit land. These ones are called mature cyclones. Luckily, as soon as they hit land, they start to lose momentum and fade away, just because they don't have the warmth of the ocean underneath. Well, that's a relief. They can still be really destructive. They are like a big circle of wind. They blow strongly until the eye of the storm passes, you know, the centre, where everything is really quiet, no wind or anything. But then the other side hits and the winds blow just as strongly, but in the other direction. It's just amazing. Yes, I would really like to cover that. Well, it looks like we've got it all arranged then. Track 21 My family isn't very big. There's just my son and me. I'm a single parent. For the last ten years, I've been concentrating on looking after my son James, who's now 14. But now I've met someone special and we've just got engaged. My fiancé has four kids of his own, and we're going to get married in July. James is really excited about it. He's looking forward to having brothers and sisters in his new step-family. We live as one big extended family. There are seven of us in our household. Besides my husband and me and our children, there's my aunt and two of my cousins. I stay at home and care for my mother because she's quite old and can't look after herself. Obviously, we suffer from a lack of space in the house, but we all get on well. Track 22 1 Firstly, I am going to talk about the role of the parent. Secondly, I'll discuss the role of the child. And lastly, we'll look at the family unit as a whole. 2. Parenting is a difficult job because no two children are ever the same. 3. Families are important because they form the basis for socialization. Additionally, they educate and protect the next generation. 4. The family structure has varied greatly over time. That is, different times have had different views of what a traditional family structure is. 5. Many argue that less traditional structures are not as effective. However, there is little evidence to support this. 6. Many people are having families later in life. Consequently, the rise in the number of single people may only be temporary. 7. Families in other parts of the world differ from the Western norm. For instance, in some cultures, having multiple husbands or wives is the norm. 8. Although there are many arguments for trying to keep the traditional family structure strong, I feel the key issue is the economic necessity of having a normal family structure. Track 23. As we have seen, changes in the structure of the family are constantly occurring, extended to nuclear, patrifocal to a more equal footing between the sexes, and dual parenting to single parenting. However, a recent phenomenon in the UK, which is changing the traditional family, is the increasing number of adults who continue to live with their parents until their 30s or sometimes even their 40s. The UK has traditionally been a society where offspring leave the family home in their late teens or early 20s to set up their own home and families. But in the last 25 years, this has decreased. Official statistics released by the Office of National Statistics show that today 10% of men in their early 30s still live with their parents. This compares with 5% of women in this age range. The reasons for this are complex and varied. It cannot be denied that some people are choosing to stay at home. Living with parents can be an easy option. Food is provided, heating and electricity are paid for, and rent, if any, is minimal. However, a third of those surveyed claimed they are living with their parents because it is too difficult to get on the property ladder. 
House prices in the last few decades have risen dramatically. Property is now five times the average annual salary, whereas it was only three times the average annual wage in the 1980s. This fact, coupled with high unemployment amongst young people, makes it virtually impossible for a single person to buy a home or even rent. The number of students going on to higher education has also been steadily increasing. Many of these students return home after finishing their studies as a result of the student debt they have accumulated. It can take many years to pay this off, and if the burden of rent or a mortgage is added to that, it can be just too much for a young adult's pocket. However, help is now at hand. The government is tackling some of the problems that cause people to remain with their parents with a new scheme, the Affordable Housing Scheme. This aims to help people part buy a house or flat by making housing more affordable for first-time buyers and possibly taking the strain away from elderly parents. Track 24 the family is a topic which we will look at in great detail this term. For sociologists, the family is often seen as the beginning of socialisation. Indeed, it is the seed of society itself. In recent decades, many old people have no longer been able to rely on their offspring for support, which was common 50 years ago. Many children are brought up by only one parent, something virtually unheard of before the 1960s. We can certainly say that during the last half century we have seen an enormous change in traditional family structures. The extended family lasted well into the early 1900s and this kind of strong family unit was essential due to property ownership. Housing often was scarce and it was necessary for people to live with parents and take over the property when their parents died. Of course, people still benefit from their family line. Still today, people generally inherit any money that their mother or father might have. In the UK, the last 50 years has also seen a decrease in the number of offspring parents have. Whereas in the 1950s, only 10% of offspring were only children. This number has risen. Nowadays, this is the case for just over a third of children. Track 25 in Victorian times, the upper classes made up less than 3% of the entire population of Britain, yet this class held more than 90% of the country's wealth. This shows the massive gap there was between rich and poor, a gap which has shrunk considerably in the last century. Today, we're going to look at the wide differences in family life between rich and poor in Victorian times. Let's begin with the upper classes. The upper classes of the Victorian period were generally the nobility or the clergy. Most of their servants were very poorly paid, but were always accommodated within the homes of upper class Victorian families, so they didn't have to pay for accommodation, food and often clothing. The money which they did earn, they normally sent home to their families. Many Victorian servants came from the countryside, where the effects of the Industrial Revolution had resulted in job losses. Amongst these servants were cooks, housemaids, stable hands and butlers. The family would also employ a nanny, who, although employed by the family, was not traditionally seen as a servant. A nanny's primary role was to care for the children. She was responsible for teaching the children how to behave, looking after them when they were ill, and instilling discipline into them. Nannies did not, however, educate the children. Generally, Children from wealthy families did not attend school outside the family home. Tutors would come to the house to do this, and although on occasion mothers taught their children to read and fathers gave their children some instruction in Latin, this was not a common occurrence. Now, the Victorian upper classes had the reputation of being quite cruel, but this wasn't always the case. They were also quite charitable. Ragged schools were set up with funding from the upper classes so that poor children could have some form of education. Additionally, most Victorian parents were very proud of their children, who were often seen as prized possessions. This goes against the common idea that parents were very hard on their children, 
In fact, the opposite was generally the rule. However, the situation for lower class families was very different. In the lower classes, child labour was rife. Children, as young as eight, earned a living as chimney sweeps for wealthy houses. Now, let's move on to looking at the lower class families in more detail. You'll find that very often.